I'm Brandi Cruz. Welcome to Undivided. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your continuing commitment to give Common Sense a comeback. It's a commitment that has brought us here today to our 100th episode of Undivided. I could not be happier. I had a little dinner last night with um, some folks who have been uh, wonderful supporters of the show from the very beginning, uh, be it financially helped us you know, get our um, uh, feet off the ground uh, or just supporters kind of in the background. It was so nice to just sit and chat about where the show has come in a year and to talk about where the show uh, is going to go from here. I'm so excited about the possibilities. And I'm so excited to still be here doing it after a year, uh, after 100 episodes, uh, because I just didn't know at the beginning. Were people going to like it? Were people going to listen to it? Did people believe in the, uh, the mission and the movement? And I, I just could not be more grateful to all of you who have come along on this ride thus far and who uh, are excited about helping bring this into the future, not just for the podcast, but for growing this mission to give a voice to people who have really felt drowned out by the fringes. So um, we have a, a great episode for you today and a special guest, Andrew Yang, a 2016 presidential candidate who is now trying to build a third party in the country around consensus and compromise and common sense. Uh, he's going to be joining us in a few minutes to talk about the forward party and about really, I think, some of the sentiments that that we share and, and those of you watching share. You know, I don't agree with Andrew Yang's, you know, former stances on a lot of things uh, when he ran as a a Democrat for president and then for the mayor of New York City. But um, to see where he's at right now and saying, look, in order to move forward as a country, we have to really focus on coming together and on building consensus uh, and on coming up with uh, policies that the majority of Americans can live with, because you can't always get everything that you want. And so really looking forward to this conversation with Andrew Yang. Also, I want to follow up on a few uh, stories from last week. And then at the end of the show, I told you guys I was going to watch the rest of this um, documentary that Candace Owens put out on the Daily Wire about BLM, uh, and I wanted to hear some of your thoughts about it, and so we'll get to that to close out the show today. Uh, first, debates. I uh, talked last week about the fact that I was livid that you have candidates who are refusing to do debates. Um, this used to be very standard. It's like, yep, um, in Washington state, we have a formal coalition that puts on formal debates. Uh, and I think they're a great, great gauge for voters, uh, especially voters who are undecided, obviously. And now you have candidates who are just saying, no, nah, I'm not going to participate. And then there's no teeth because the coalition isn't um, forcing candidates to just say, OK, either you participate or there's an empty podium, which is how it should be and which is how it has been. Um, so a couple things. So. Uh, Senator Patty Murray, who's running against Republican challenger Tiffany Smiley, has officially refused to participate in either of the coalition debates. That is a final decision uh, that came down over the weekend. And in fact, I was um, speaking at an event uh, on Friday uh, and uh, Tiffany Smiley was at my table and she was the one who told me, she showed me the, the press release that... Um, Patty Murray was refusing the second debate, which was supposed to be on October 25th. Um, and, you know, she seemed disappointed, but she did not seem surprised. And frankly, I wasn't surprised either. And then I found out all the drama that happened behind the scenes and the craziness leading up to that decision. So the coalition, as I've told you before, is uh, made up of a number of the um, mainstream media organizations across the state. And the reason there's a coalition is because it takes a lot of effort to put on a debate, but also you get the best moderators and then you have all the stations agree to televise it. So it reaches as many voters as possible. So those are the high stakes debates. Those are the most difficult debates. Those are the most telling debates. Those are the debates that you want candidates participating in. But behind the scenes, Patty Murray's team had already said, OK, we weren't going to do the October 7th debate. They they were, you know, leaving the possibility open that they do the October 25th debate. And apparently behind the scenes, I'm told they were sort of looking around for a different type of debate, like maybe someone would hold a town hall style debate or a candidate forum, something that would be less risky, that fewer people would see. And um, I put this in my Sunday newsletter, Cairo TV. Honestly, I, I, they should be ashamed of themselves for what they did. So what happened is Cairo 7 News uh, in Seattle went behind the scenes and put together their own independent um, town hall style event for the U.S. Senate race. And as soon as they did that, Patty Murray agreed to it and said she wasn't going to do the coalition debate. And you might be saying, oh, what's the big deal? Then I guess Tiffany Smiley and Patty Murray, they'll get together and they'll do this um, 
town hall style debate on Cairo TV. Well, the big deal is that this is a, first of all, a town hall is not a, a, is not a debate. Um, a town hall style form. You know, who is Cairo 7 going to have in the crowd? Who are they going to put in there to ask questions? What kind of questions are they going to be? I'm not saying that citizens and voters can't ask good questions of candidates, but it's much different. It's a much different style than having two people up at a podium debating the issues and being questioned by political journalists who are very knowledgeable about what's going on. Um, so that's one thing. But the second thing is Cairo 7 is doing this exclusive to them. So Cairo 7 has so far refused to let any of the other stations broadcast it. They're using it as a ratings boon to themselves. They totally undercut the debate coalition by having their own thing. It gave Patty Murray an excuse to dip out and to say, nope, not going to do that debate, but I'm still debating Tiffany Smiley because now I'm doing this Cairo 7 thing. Um, and so the fact that Cairo 7, one, gave Patty Murray an out uh, is ridiculous, and they should have known that that's what would happen. And then two, the fact that Cairo 7 will not let other stations broadcast it is so contrary to the spirit of, of elections and what these events are supposed to be out be about. You're not letting other stations broadcast it because you want everyone watching your station and you're putting it on and I get it. But if this is a town hall for voters, shouldn't you want as many voters to see it as possible? Like that's just a dumb TV bullshit where it's like, ah, competition. It's like, this is supposed to be about voters. And that's what the coalition is about. So anyway, after um, Cairo 7 completely undercut things, the coalition came out and said, well, we're not going to hold the October 25th debate, even with an empty podium. And they tell me that's because media organizations said we're not going to air a podium with only or we're not going to air a, a debate with only one candidate uh, and an empty lectern um, next to that candidate, which I think is is short sighted. Um, and I think any media outlets who said we're not going to air that should be ashamed of themselves because they're totally undercutting the ability to get candidates to debate in the future. So in Washington state, we've seen this with the uh, secretary of state's race with the Democrat uh, Steve Hobbs saying he's not going to debate and the coalition just canceled it instead of letting the, his opponent, Julie, Ch uh, Julie Anderson, debate. And then now you're seeing it with the U.S. Senate debate where they're like, oh, well, if she doesn't want to participate, I guess we just won't air anything. So. What's stopping a candidate down the road from just saying, well, no, I'm not participating in, in a debate coalition debate because they're just going to cancel it if I don't show up anyway. And so my, it's not like my opponent's going to get free airtime. So to me, it totally undercuts the position of the coalition, the ability of the media to get candidates in a debate setting for the benefit of voters, because let's not forget, it's supposed to be for the benefit of voters. Um, and so that's really disappointing. But I just had to make a note about Patty Murray. Um, you know, I think it's a little ridiculous that someone who has been in the Senate for 30 years doesn't want to stand up on a stage next to her opponent, who's a complete political newcomer, and answer questions from local news journalists for an hour. I mean, if you've been in the Senate that long, with the weight that she has in the Senate, you would think that that would be an easy thing to do, a very easy exercise for her. Um, but I had to laugh because in Georgia, there is a high profile Senate race going on there uh, between the incumbent Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock and his Republican challenger, a Trump backed candidate named Herschel Walker. So there was a debate in that race hosted by the Atlanta Press Club and Herschel Walker decided not to show up. And there's headlines about, oh, my gosh, Herschel Walker didn't show up. Um, and what did they do? Well, the Atlanta Press Club didn't cancel the debate. They still had the debate and they left an empty podium where Herschel Walker would have been. But what's really interesting is what, again, Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock had to say about Herschel Walker's absence. I think it's important to point out that my opponent, Herschel Walker, is not here. Uh, and I think that half of being a Senate, a senator is showing up. Half of being a senator is showing up. I wonder if that same sentiment from Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock would apply to his Democratic colleague, Senator Patty Murray. Half of being a Senate, a senator is showing up. The following segment is brought to you in partnership with Future 42. Turn your frustration into action by signing up at future42.org. A huge win over the weekend for members of Seattle's Chinatown International District community. This is a story that we've been detailing now for weeks. 
uh, members of the CID community had been pushing back against a planned expansion of a homelessness uh, complex, would have allowed for 500 shelter beds, and it was uh, scheduled to be uh, expanded near their neighborhood. And they were like, listen, we've had so many crime issues. You haven't consulted us about this. We haven't given you input about this. We're worried about the impacts of it. And you even had some uh, residents of the Chinatown International District community who said, you know, you've got these progressive politicians who love to come down here and use us for photo ops. But when we come to them with real concerns about something, they, they just dismiss it. They're not uh, coming to the table to talk to us. So anyway, one of the reasons we've talked about it so much is Jonathan Cho, an independent journalist for Discovery Institute, has really been kept from getting answers from King County Executive Dow Constantine's office on it. Um, you know, we've played a couple clips where Dow Constantine fled uh, from a press conference down a private elevator to avoid questions on it from Jonathan Cho. Then Jonathan Cho, a couple weeks later, was blocked from entering a press tour of the site of this uh, homelessness shelter. So anyway, Dow Constantine comes out on Friday and his office said that they're deciding to scrap plans for this shelter expansion, which of course people in the CID were thrilled about. Executive Constantine saying, I announced today that King County will maintain the current lease for the Salvation Army operated shelter in Soto while redirecting resources that were going to expand services at the site to invest in other projects. And he went on to talk about concerns the community had. He said, it is clear that building trust and resolving underlying concerns about the conditions in the community today will take considerable time before or we can move forward with any added service capacity. Which is really interesting to me that you now have Dow Constantine acknowledging that there are some trust issues. Um, community members uh, want you know, to have more of a say. Because if you recall the first sort of crazy interaction between Dow Constantine and Jonathan Cho, Jonathan Cho was trying to ask Dow Constantine about this very issue, about the fact that CID residents felt like he had not considered or asked for their input before pushing ahead with this. So Dow Constantine flees this press conference and then in the most sanctimonious fashion, when Jonathan Cho follows him into the hallway, he acts like, well, of course, I'm, I'm in the CID all the time listening to their concerns. It's just absurd to suggest that, that we haven't considered their input or we don't care about their input. Oh, I'm in the Chinatown community continuously, but... So why not put a moratorium on this before public input? You're not actually a journalist. So anyway, after insulting Jonathan Cho and refusing to answer his questions, now Dow's giving in for this very reason, saying, yeah, the, the uh, Chinatown ID community doesn't uh, feel like we've, we've valued their input and we need to fix those relationships. So I just think it's you know, all the vilification of Jonathan Cho and now Dow's like, okay, we're going to put a pause on this, which I don't think would have happened, by the way, had Jonathan Cho not, he was the only journalist in town shining a light on what was going on down there. And for that reason, another aspect of this infuriated me, and I think it should anger anyone who expects elected leaders of any political party to act with an ounce of self-awareness, um, to be reflective about their own shortcomings, which apparently is just too much to ask these days. So council member, Seattle City Council member Tammy Morales, she is the councilwoman who her, her district includes the Chinatown International District neighborhood. And if you recall, when there were protests happening in that neighborhood over this um, planned expansion, some of the elders in Chinatown were holding signs with Councilwoman Morales' face on it crossed out. What better sign or signal could you get that your constituents are not happy with you, right? So Councilwoman Tammy Morales puts out a statement about um, Dow Constantine scrapping plans for this enhanced shelter project. And the gist of her statement was, look, I'm, I'm, I think we really need this shelter, uh, so I'm a little disappointed that it's not moving forward. But she acknowledges that her community had real concerns about not being consulted. And then she goes on to say, for the love of God, for the love of all things gaslighting, I just could not believe this line in her statement. So she talks about the lack of transparency that was a frustration for folks in the community. And then she went on to say this. This lack of transparency allowed for bad faith political actors without ties to the CID, such as a conservative think tank, to co-opt the narrative and cloud organic neighborhood resistance. 
So she's clearly talking about Jonathan Cho. So let me get this straight, Councilwoman. You're blaming Jonathan Cho, who, by the way, is an Asian American journalist, for daring to detail the concerns of Seattle's Asian American community. You're for some reason vilifying Jonathan Cho for daring to listen to community members that you had ignored. And that's somehow co-opting the narrative and clouding organic neighborhood resistance. You wouldn't even have known about that neighborhood resistance had Jonathan Cho not done stories about it, Councilwoman. And you would be wise to remember whose face they had plastered on signs with a big red line across it. And as you seek re-election in 2023, you would be wise to be a little bit introspective about your own failings as an elected leader. The previous segment was brought to you in partnership with Future 42. Turn your frustration into action at future42.org. This message is brought to you by Washington's Emergency Management Division. Today is October 17th, and that means in three days, there is going to be the largest earthquake drill in the world happening. Millions of people, and you should be one of them because we should all be prepared for what we would do if there's an earthquake because it could happen it could happen right now it could happen at any moment uh, and so you guys have probably heard about it by now i've been talking about it on the podcast it's called the great washington shakeout everyone who wants to participate in the drill is asked to drop cover and hold on just to kind of go through the motions at that very moment of what you would do if there were to be a major earthquake you can find uh, all of these tips at shakeout.org forward slash Washington. And if you're participating, make sure to use the uh, hashtag shakeout on social media. But at the very least, make sure you talk to your family and friends about what you would do in the event of an earthquake and then join the Great Washington Shakeout at 1020 a.m. local time on October 20th, where you will drop cover and hold along with millions of other people so that we are as prepared as we can be for a major earthquake. This message is brought to you by Washington's Emergency Management Division. As you know, today is the 100th episode of Undivided, and I wanted to have a guest on who kind of epitomizes uh, some of what we're working toward. And, you know, because I think it's it's easy to kind of just talk about frustrations about the political system. It's much harder to actually put the work in to try to fix it. And I think our next guest is trying to do just that. Um, Andrew Yang, I've talked about his book uh, on the show before, Forward Notes on the Future of Our Democracy. It's an interesting read if you haven't uh, read it already. But he was obviously a 2016 presidential contender, went on to run for the mayor of New York City. And now he has started something called the Forward Party, which is really a, a party and a movement that's built around the idea idea that we have to work together. We have to build consensus. We have to compromise. We really have to break free from this two-party system that just leads to gridlock and bickering and divisiveness. So Andrew Yang and I had an opportunity to talk about the forward party and where he hopes to take the movement from here. Andrew Yang, welcome to Undivided. It's great to be here, Brandy. Thanks for having me. Uh, what's life like for you these days? I just got back from Utah where I was campaigning for Evan McMullen for U.S. Senate. And the Forward Party has endorsed another couple dozen candidates everywhere from local up to uh, congressional and Senate. So we're, we're getting out hopefully hundreds, maybe even thousands of volunteers to try and push some great candidates uh, uh, over the finish line. Yeah, Evan McMullen is interesting. Uh, he came out and said he wouldn't caucus with Republicans or Democrats. I was sort of like, well, how would that work? Because you wouldn't get any committee assignments or anything, right? Well, you're actually guaranteeing one committee assignment through Senate mm -hmm. rules. So someone's going <laughs> to have him on. Um, uh, and we've seen that it can be someone in the middle who's an independent who can actually sway and impact and sometimes determine policy. You've seen that with uh, Joe Manchin on the Democratic side. And I think there's a chance Evan ends up the Joe Manchin equivalent on the other side. Uh, who are some other uh, candidates uh, for the November election that Forward Party has endorsed? Well, we've endorsed two other Senate candidates, Lisa Murkowski in Alaska, who famously voted to impeach Donald Trump uh, and is living to tell about it. So go, Lisa. Uh, and Mark Kelly, who's 
running against Blake Masters in Arizona. Uh, excited about both Lisa and Mark. And then there are, gosh, like another couple dozen uh, candidates from Congressional Down that I don't want to try and list because I'm going to leave someone out. <laughs> what's the what's the test for you guys? How does someone earn the endorsement of the forward party? What are you looking for? Well, a lot of it is driven by our state leads and our activists and volunteers in each state uh, because they get excited about a particular candidate. They bring them to us. Sometimes the candidates or campaigns reach out to us as well. And then we have a political committee that comes together. The vast majority of the candidates we're backing are running against someone you'd consider an extremist, uh, probably someone who uh, either Trump has endorsed uh, or has been um aligned with very closely. So that's not a requisite, but that seems to be a very consistent pattern. Yeah. Um, obviously, I want to talk about forward party and sort of where you guys are at and how you're you're trying to grow. I had to ask you, I watched the Jim Acosta interview a couple months ago. What the hell was that about? Hey, don't you have to take a position on something? You don't you have to take a position of... on something? You can't just say, well, I, you well, know, this I, is a hot button issue, so I'm not going to take a position on you. You know, if you want to run the country, you're going to have to make some hard decisions, Andrew. Do you guys have some history? What was the deal with that? Yeah, I, I was surprised by the level of antagonism as well. I mean, heck, uh, you know, I'm on CNN occasionally, and most of the time it's not quite that hostile or overbearing. <laughs> but I, I think Jim has taken on a particular persona um, in order to, uh, frankly, get ratings and have an identity. Uh, and I, I think antagonizing me is part of that. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm all for hard questions and making you kind of justify and explain your decisions, but it just seemed like, yeah, like you said, I think hostile was a very good word for it. I saw some people coming to your defense over it, but, you know, one of the points I think that it was valid that he was making is sort of, do you have to take more concrete platform positions on issues? So before we get to that, I guess, what is the platform of the forward party? The platform of the Forward Party revolves around three pillars, free people, uh, thriving communities, and a vibrant democracy. Uh, and so if you're helping accomplish one of those goals, then we're going to be excited. Uh, but we want to be able to help people in both Massachusetts and Mississippi, which means trying to provide a uh, genuine choice. And so if you wind up trying to line up on this left-right spectrum. We don't think that's where most Americans are. And we think the real problem isn't left or right. It's those of us on the outside looking in. Uh, and unfortunately, that describes the vast majority of Americans at this point. That's what Ford is designed to change. Yeah, and I mean, this is, I mean, that's why we wanted to have you on so bad. It's like, this is, we call it political commentary for the anti-fringe. Uh, and so I think there's a huge voice of Americans who are just exhausted. But for you, you know, not only were you a Democrat and ran as a Democrat, but, you know, you had um, policy prescriptions that certainly wouldn't be considered moderate, like a universal basic income, for example. So do you have to, to achieve what the Ford Party is trying to achieve? Do you have to put some of your personal um, desires and stances aside? Well, that, that's so perceptive of you, Brandy. The, the fact is right now, the top priority for thinking Americans is trying to make our system work, uh, trying to create an actual functioning government that's representative and, and reflects popular will. <laughs> and if we have that, then we could have coherent conversations about what kind of policies you want to advance. But until then, um, most of it's just being used, frankly, to pit us against each other. So when you ask me, hey, Andrew, are you checking your own policy preferences at the door? I think at this point, our policy preferences are just being used to tribalize and inflame. And the main thing I'm about is making it so that there's a genuine connection between what we want and what our representatives do. Yeah, and I totally can appreciate that. I do think there's a question about at some point, do you feel like you need to say, um, here's where we believe the consensus of most Americans is at on issues like abortion, gun control, policing? Yeah, I, I think that's the way it's going to play out in real life. Uh, we are having our first ever national convention next summer, and there are going to be thousands of people from around the country. And if everyone coalesces around a particular point of view, um, then I think that's where the party will land. But I think that should be people driven and not elite driven, honestly, you know what I mean? Like it, it should be that all of the people that have uh, come together to form the forward party in states around the country actually tell us what they believe. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, um, Lisa Murkowski, Evan McMullen, Mark Kelly. I mean, those are people who have disagreements, politically speaking, who don't agree on on policy. So when 
you know, if you open up the forward party to people across the political spectrum who just want to see the government function, does it make it inherently difficult to come up with a policy platform that's specific? Well, uh, again, right now, the these uh, policy prescriptions are being used essentially to set us up to combat each other. It's like, oh, you want, uh, you know, to address climate change or whatnot. You know who your enemy is? Those guys over there. When re in reality, the system is not set up to solve our problems or reward leaders who prioritize solving our problems. So uh, I, I think the coherent policy platform starts with actually reforming our structures. And if we reform our structures, then popular will will lead us in a better direction policy wise. Tell me about what's happening on the ground throughout the states to try to bring people into the fold. Yeah, you know, we have tens of thousands of active volunteers, hundreds of thousands on our mailing list. We've raised millions of dollars. Um, but the the reality is that you have to be very hardcore to be showing up <laughs> like on the regular uh, for forward party county leadership meetings and the rest of it. Um, and I'm thrilled to say that we have state leads now in 42 of the 50 states and volunteers in all 50 states. And so when I go to a place like Illinois um, or, or Utah or wherever, um, I'll meet with party leadership, and there are generally a couple of dozen very, very activated volunteers who are trying to get behind local candidates. And, and it's that nucleus that is going to enable us to grow as we qualify uh, as a political party in more states and get behind candidates. Most humans, most Americans care about politics when they care about a candidate in a race they think matters to them. Um, and the, our activists realize that there's actually something that comes before all of that, which I suspect your listeners do as well, um, which is that you need to actually reform the structures and incentives. Um, and so the, the state leads and the volunteers in every state are helping lead the charge on those kinds of reforms to set the stage so that our candidates can compete. Yeah, one of the things you've been a big proponent of is ranked choice voting, which I think is an interesting concept. I do have some hesitations about it. You know, when you ran for mayor of New York uh, City, it seemed confusing as hell to me, to be honest. It was like people teaming up with people and I, I guess try to kind of walk people through the incentive of that system. Sure. The, the single best thing I can say about ranked choice voting is that it'll enable you to vote for whomever you want and no one can accuse you of wasting your vote or spoiling it for anyone. Because if you vote for the third party candidate and they don't win, then your vote will flow through to uh, the major party candidate. And that is the cudgel that gets used against upstart new parties all the time. It's like, oh, you're going to screw it up. You're going to screw it up. It's like, well, if you adopt ranked choice voting, then no one can screw anything up. And you know what the response never is to that. It's like, oh, that's a great idea. We should do that. Um, because the reality is the two parties have no interest in genuine competition. Uh, they don't have any interest in having the uh, will of the voters actually expressed in the ballot. Um, so if you point out that ranked choice voting enables you to vote for whomever you want with no negative impact on you know the major parties or, or, or whatnot, they still will fight you tooth and nail because they know that if you had the ability to vote for whomever you want, they would lose power. And this is being brought out in Nevada right now, where ranked choice voting and nonpartisan open primaries, where anyone can vote for anyone, are on the ballot. Uh, and the Democrats in power in Nevada are fighting it tooth and nail. They already spent seven figures trying to knock it out. And their rationale is not uh, anything other than that it's, it's going to be uh, complicated and confusing, which, by the way, 85% of both Alaskans and New Yorkers said it was easy to use and I would want to do it again. Um, and so when you have a chance to use it, uh, Brandy, it ends up being very, very straightforward. My kids can rank one, two, three when I ask them what kind of food they want for dinner. Well, I'm just a simple, you know, lady originally from the Midwest. Numbers confuse me. I know you're a numbers guy. No, I'm sure it'll be easy. I just think you know, one of the things that kind of was hard to follow for me in the New York mayoral race was that sort of teaming up of candidates to try to sort of beat the ranked choice voting system. Um, so how do you, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, first, let me say that in the New York primary context, it's not as interesting or useful because you're still within a party primary. Uh, imagine if you could just have anyone of any party uh, and then if I trash you, then we both end up looking bad. And then the, the third person ends up looking better by comparison. Um, within the primary, it, it's mildly helpful, but not that interesting. It gets much more interesting if you include everyone of every party. So the New York primary is, you know, in, in many ways, um, an imperfect example.
Yeah. Um, who's been more hostile toward your movement, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? No, I, I think it's typically been the Democratic Party for a couple of reasons. One is that Democrats think that all votes come from them. <laughs> So they're like, oh, we're going to take our votes. We're going to take our votes. And then again, you're like, look, if you have ranked choice voting, no one takes anyone's votes. And then again, and then they're like, oh, oh, like, you know, they, they still just don't have any rational counter to that. They just think like, you know, you're going to get our votes. The other thing is that I used to be a Democrat. And so because of that, there is this sense that I'm going to to take um, energy uh, from, from their side of, of the aisle. So I, I think that's the general uh, gist of it. Um, the fact is, on the Republican side, there are a lot of more moderate Republicans that are totally not on board with Trumpism and Trump. Uh, and so when you say to them, hey, there might be another way, they're actually very, very receptive. I think more Democrats will be receptive if they lose the House uh, or the Senate in November. But absent, you know, ranked choice voting becoming a reality, there is a chance you could be a spoiler. Are you going to have you ruled out 2024? Where are you at with that? Well, it's one reason why we're so excited about a candidate and campaign like Evan McMullen, where he's running as an independent and it's just him versus, in that case, the Trump endorsed incumbent. So no, no spoiler effect to worry about. The fact is 70 percent of races of the 506,000 local races around the country are uncontested or uncompetitive. And so you don't really need to worry about the spoiler effect. Most of the people watching this or listening to this live in either a blue or red district where it's uncompetitive, uh, the minority party really has no say. And so if you wind up trying to create a meaningful choice in, let's call it California, Democrats run everything, uh, Republicans don't matter in most of the place, mo most of the state. And so if you wind up running candidates uh, against the Democrats, and that's a real choice, it'd be reversed in a rural area in a red state. Um, so the spoiler effect only applies when you talk about essentially presidential races. Mm -hmm. And right now we're just completely... Um, focused on other races, especially since the 22 cycle is only a number of days away. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I love the idea of mixing it up. Two party isn't working for, for our country. But if we are talking about the presidential race in 2024, is that something that you're still actively considering? Well, one of the things I, I would say is 58% uh, of Americans aren't pumped about having either Donald Trump or Joe Biden in the rematch. Mm -hmm. um, their combined age will be 159 in 2024. <laughs> Uh, and you have to say it's a deeply irrational, dysfunctional system that's presenting those two guys as your number one and number two choices. So if there were a third option, and there's a group called No Labels that's investing 53 million in ballot access for a unity ticket or some third option, tens of millions of Americans will seriously look at whatever that option is. So you're not ruling it out is what I take from that answer. What, 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 I, what I'm saying is that uh, I think millions of Americans are going to be looking for alternatives if we wind up with a, <laughs> a Trump Biden rematch. And just for the record, how old are you now, Andrew? I'm 47. One of the my favorite parts of the book. You'll probably hate to hear this because it was just a picture. I loved your high school your or your high school picture. Oh, thank you. You know, it's it when it wound up being um, a, a source of entertainment for the campaign uh, as opposed to embarrassment. <laughs> so it was great. That way. I mean, it was like model qual. I'll put it up on screen for folks. I love that picture. So uh, I want to ask you really quickly. I know we're running out of time. Tulsi Gabbard, what do you make of her very high profile departure from the Democratic Party? No, I, I think it was inevitable uh, where, uh, despite the fact that she was a Democratic member of Congress, I mean, uh, a lot of her uh, sentiments uh, and messages have been very, very, very contrary to uh, the Democratic Party orthodoxy. Um, and so I thought her leaving was just a matter of time. Do you agree with some of the sentiments that she stated in her announcement about the Democratic Party? I can no longer remain in today's Democratic Party that's under the complete control of an elitist cabal of warmongers who were driven by cowardly wokeness. Well, I, I, I think that there, there are a lot of people that are frustrated with elements of the Democratic Party. A, a lot of it is a symptom of the fact that they're just these two parties and they wind up not having to compete with anything but each other. Uh, and so it'll end up leading towards extremes because you have this ideological subgroup that, that's going to wind up being louder and more prominent. It's one reason why your audience and what Forward is trying to build, it's so important, is that there is this reasonable, silent, exhausted majority uh, that is right now uh, kind of silenced 
by the the two party system. So there, I'm sure there are a lot of people that that feel similarly um, to what was expressed. And is she the kind of politician who would be welcomed or even endorsed at some point by the forward party? Uh, you know, the the forward party uh, is not Andrew Yang. The forward party is lots of different people. And so if everyone came together and said, look, uh, let, let's get behind a certain candidate, then, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure we'd explore it. Do you like her as a politician? Uh, Tulsi and I always got along personally when we were on the trail. Uh, one of the things you have to know is that you're uh, in the Union Hall in New Hampshire or the uh, barbecue in Iowa, and you're just chilling with other candidates uh, before and after you both speak. Um, so Tulsi and I have been friendly for years, and uh, her husband's a, a really great guy, too. She was lucky enough to travel with her husband uh, as her photographer. Well, liking her as a person isn't the same as liking her as a politician. Do you like her brand of politics? Uh, I certainly like the fact that that she seems... Uh, genuinely independent. Uh, and I think that her recent decision reflects that. Well, let's end with this. Um, I've already talked about your book on the show before. Um, so certainly folks should read forward if they haven't already. But if they want to actually join the forward party movement, how can they do that? Go to forwardparty.com. We've got a, a, a chapter in your state. You can go meet some awesome people. I have a feeling that they're very much like you. Uh, fed up with the dysfunctional duopoly and the status quo. It's not going to end unless we actually present and build a common sense, positive, unifying alternative. So come help us build it at forwardparty.com. Yeah, I love it. Well, I love to, I just, I mean, this is our first time chatting, but it's nice to talk to someone who's politically inclined, who can speak like a real human, like a real human being conversation. Um, and so that's something I've always appreciated about your just speaking style and the way that you operate. And it's our hundredth episode today. So I was wow. like, I, Happy I cannot. Happy hundred episodes, undivided. Thank you. Have I we could... fixed everything yet? We'll have no. to do it over the next hundred episodes. I know. So, all right, Andrew Yang, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Brandy. So again, thank you to Andrew Yang for joining us for our 100th episode of Undivided. Again, if you haven't read his book already, um, I really enjoyed it. And I think that if you like this podcast, some of the things that he's talking about, you might not agree 100% with um, you know, where he wants to take the forward party or you're concerned about the idea of uh, vote splitting or you know um, being a spoiler in a presidential race. But I definitely think the book is worth a read and, and to check out uh, what the forward party is up to. But like I said, it's one thing for, you know, like me to talk about these issues and to express frustration with the two party system. I think it's another thing to be doing the work on the ground. And there is little doubt that Andrew Yang is doing the work. I want to end the show today by following up on something that we talked about on Friday. So I said I'd started watching the uh, documentary from Candace Owens on The Daily Wire uh, about BLM and looking into sort of what happened with George Floyd, the genesis of, of BLM as an organization, and how some of like the $90 million they raised was spent. The documentary is called The Greatest Lie Ever Sold. And what I said on Friday is I know that Candace Owens is controversial, but I will say about The Daily Wire, they put out quality content just from a production standpoint. Um, it is a really well-produced piece. Uh, so I had watched the first half hour on uh, Friday and I gave you guys some initial thoughts and wanted you to kind of go watch it and then said that we'd talk about it on Monday. My general takeaway is that if you watch this documentary and you came away with nothing that you thought was interesting, then you didn't watch it with an open mind because it's impossible to deny that particularly when it comes to BLM's spending, it, it was incredibly problematic. I mean, uh, Patrice Colliers, who is the... Um, co-founder of BLM. I mean, she hired her mom and her brother. Her brother was like a graffiti artist before this. And she hired him to do security and paid him almost a million dollars in a year. She also paid uh, the father of her child nearly a million dollars for providing production stuff. Um, BLM as an organization gave $8 million to an organization based in Canada, 6 million of which was used to buy property in downtown Toronto. And that organization happened to be co-founded by Patrice's wife. Um, you had millions of dollars to transgender and LGBTQ issues that aren't specific to helping black America. So I, I kind of wish my only thing is like that to me is the most powerful part of the documentary. I care less to kind of relive everything that happened with George Floyd and his death, um, because I feel like we could litigate that to the end of time and people are going to have disagreements about it. You know, um, I, I think there's differences of opinion in medical consensus about 
what ha- what actually killed George Floyd. And so I just, that part of it to me was not as interesting. I think this concept of you had this thing, this terrible thing that happened to George Floyd and millions of dollars were raised as a result. And a huge chunk of that money was spent enriching the co-founder and people in her inner circle. Everyone should be mad about that. Everyone should be mad about that. People who donated money, people who believed in the movement, people who marched for the movement. Um, to find out that you know you gave this money to help black people in America and it helped, sure, a small group of black people in America, but it was uh, people who co-founded it who wanted to buy mansions for themselves, who wanted to buy real estate, who wanted to help their brother. Um, that to me, it should be non-controversial. I realize that you're going to have a whole segment of the population who is just going to lose it over anything Candace Owens does. But to not watch that really with an open mind and say, man, that is not right what this organization did with some of that money. I think if you can't get there, I just that you're not you're not entering it with an open mind and you shouldn't have just you shouldn't have watched it anyway. So anyway, uh, some thoughts from a couple of you. Um, Kelsey said, if people are donating to charities that they haven't personally vetted and that do not have ratings on GuideStar or Charity Navigator, then they shouldn't be surprised when they get scammed. Um, and, and that's true. I think you always have to do your due diligence. I just think BLM and the organization, I mean, it just went overnight. I think a lot of that money came in offshore emotion. Um, people just trusted it would be used uh, well. Uh, let's see. Um, in response to my comment about Candace Owens, like me understanding that she's controversial, Alisa says Candace is controversial because she refuses to play victim and very intelligently points out the hypocrisy. Read this whole situation. And I agree. I mean, Candace Owens is very smart. Um, and I do believe that she did a good job of opening our eyes to how that money was spent. Uh, and you know, she, she interviewed in the documentary, some folks who were close to George Floyd, um, for instance, two people he used to room with and was very polite and, and kind to them and gave them an opportunity to talk about the George Floyd they knew. And so again, I think you just have to go into this documentary, even if you don't like Candace Owens and say, Hey, like, let me give this a chance with an open mind. And I really think you would have come away with something. Um, but I had a lot of you guys commenting on um, the aspect of this that had to do with George Floyd's death and what specifically caused it. And that's kind of my issue is I don't think that's the most interesting or untold part of this story. And that seems to be a big part of what people came away from the documentary with. Whereas I would have liked people just to come away with this acknowledgement that like, wow, BLM was kind of a scam. So anyway, uh, documentary worth watching. I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, do I agree with everything Candace Owens says or does? Of course not. I think um, there was a little bit of like anti-transgender sentiment. I felt like that was kind of built into some of what she said, uh, which I'm just not a fan of. But uh, overall, I mean, The Daily Wire, it's a, I spend like, I don't know, $10 a month on The Daily Wire. And I think they put out exceptional content. All right. That is it for this 100th episode of Undivided. And let's hope that there are hundreds more to come. Um, in December, we're going to be doing a more in-depth survey that will go out uh, because this is a people-powered podcast. I mean, it is um, funded by you, the, the listeners and the watchers of the podcast. And so what we really want to do is um, get your feedback on kind of the first 100 episodes, what you would like to see done differently, what you would like to see more of. Uh, and it just helps us in sort of expanding our movement and fine-tuning our, our mission. Uh, and so when that survey comes out in December, I really hope all of you will take a couple minutes uh, to um, answer the questions. But again, thank you for your commitment to giving Common Sense a comeback. Thank you for believing in this mission and in this movement. Uh, thank you again to Andrew Yang for joining us on the show today. I really enjoyed our conversation. It was funny. We got off and he's like, hey, stick around. I want to talk to you some more. And we just sat around after and chatted about what's happening in politics. And I really, really enjoyed the conversation. He's a nice guy. All right. That is it for today's episode of Undivided. If you have not become a subscriber already, uh, you can join us in two ways on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash undivided. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash undivided. Or you can become a contributor on my locals community, brandycruz.locals. Dot com. You can become a subscriber for as little as $5 a month and you get access to a bonus episode just like this every single Wednesday. Undivided is presented by our founding sponsor, 1530 Mortgage. Visit them at 1530mortgage.com.